So if we consider um, the detailed questions, if we can consider question three, mm -hmm. it says, were participants appropriately allocated to the intervention and control group? Uh -huh. so, the, so the first thing we need to consider here is what approach was taken to uh, the randomization? Any ideas? Um, I think they randomized the practices, but they did not randomize the individual patients. Yeah. And also what they did is that they uh, grouped the uh, practices by the size of the practice and also by the number of years the dentist had been in practice. Okay. Um, so that's the kind of stratification of the of the sample. So why do you think it's important that the number of years that the dentist would graduated was used to, to sort of stratify the sample? Um, could it be because uh, like the more experienced dentist uh, would be more confident in giving advice to, to their patients? Yeah, some people think that um, if you're an experienced dentist you're used to communicating to patients particularly about things that can sometimes be a bit sensitive for patients but actually, um, within the curriculum for, for dentists, it's only perhaps in the last uh, 10 years that we've had um, advice about smoking included in the curriculum. So what we find now is that it's younger dentists that are more confident to bring this up, rather than the older dentists. But it's still important that um, that's included uh, in the analysis. So if we think now about um, how the randomization actually was conducted, sometimes we use things like random number tables or um, we can do online generation of randomization. Could anybody find anything written down in the paper about how it was actually done? No. 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 So we no. didn't have that detail. and. For a good paper, we'd expect them to actually just have one line that said, this is how the randomization was actually conducted. Mm. But we had no information given here. If we move on now to think about the actual intervention and the number of groups, how many groups were there um, for the, the smoking part of the study? Um, uh, for the smoking, patient were three groups. Uh, the first group received uh, usual care, yeah. there was a second group with a minimal intervention and extended intervention, the third group. Right, so we had three groups and how many um, practices roughly were in each of those three groups? On the first one, the usual care, 25 uh, practice, and the minimal intervention, 26 and 24 in the third one. Yeah. So we've got smoking, we've got three groups, a control group, and then two groups okay. that had interventions. But how about the smokeless um, tobacco? Um, I think the smokeless tobacco group was divided in two groups. Uh, one was the usual care, which was the control group, and the yep. other was the extended intervention, which was 50 uh, practices. But it was done because I think they thought that the number of people for smokeless tobacco were, were less than the number for the smoking groups. Yeah, so we have less people actually using mm -hmm. the smokeless, smokeless tobacco. tobacco. Okay, um, one of the things that's important when you're looking at a trial is to see whether there was any difference in the groups in terms of the important characteristics before the trial started. So that if you have any differences at the end, you know that that's due to the intervention um, and not differences at the beginning. So what we look for is if there's any significant differences before um, at baseline between the groups. Now did anybody notice in the paper whether this was referred to or not? Were there any differences between those groups? No, I, I couldn't spot that. Um, anybody no. else notice it? No, they were... They they haven't really mentioned about the... There is a mention of significant differences, but not clearly done. So, um, this one's quite tricky to spot, but if you look at the um, page 996, which is in the results, 
-hmm. And if you look at the bottom of that first column, mm -hmm. you'll see that they do mention that there were several significant differences. And that was in demographic factors and mm. tobacco use variables. Things like age, marital status, total oral health problems, number of alcoholic drinks, coffee drinking and toothbrushing. So if we've got these differences between the groups to start off with, what impact do you think that might have on the actual results? So if we think, for example, um, marital status, why do you think it's important that they were equal in terms of marital status before we started? Um, maybe if you're living with a person with smoke, uh, smokes, it's difficult for you to quit smoking. Yeah, so you're living in yeah. an environment where your husband or wife is smoking, then yes, it's probably going to be more difficult to actually give up. But any other... But like, thoughts? on the other hand, if your partner doesn't smoke, then they could be more supportive for you to stop. Yeah, mm. so we could see both sides of it there. But actually, um, I think it's probably just important that there was no significant differences, ideally, at the start on that variable. Um, but I think because they were randomising practices rather than patients, mm -hmm. that probably is why that happened. So in some ways, um, it's a limitation of this study that there were differences before they started, but they do mention that in the analysis, they took account of these differences. So on the one hand, there's a limitation that they did have differences, but they did acknowledge that and try to take account of it in the analysis. So that brings us to the end of question three.